The Edible Bean School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by Hensel Co-op. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to the Edible Bean School. Uh, every year, dry bean growers wrestle with insects and the impact they have on yield and quality. Um, some of the pests arrive early in the season. Some of them come later. Some do damage above ground, while others do their business underground. On this episode, we're going to take a look at the big yield robbers in edible beans and, and how to identify and best manage these pests. Um, to tackle this topic, I'm joined by Megan Moran. She is a omaphras, canola, and edible bean specialist. Hi, Megan. Hey, thanks for stopping by. Yeah, thanks for having me, Byrne. I'm glad to be a part of the edible bean school. Great to have you on. Hey, um, first question for you. When it comes to insect damage in edible beans, um, what type of impact can we see on yield and quality? Yeah, of course, we do see yield and quality is a major concern. Um, so we have kind of three different pest situations. We have the below ground pests that really just reduce plant stands, which may lead to replanting or maybe some yield reduction. And then we have, I guess, the chewers and the suckers. So the chewers are like bean leaf beetle, western bean cutworm, corn borer, Japanese beetle, and a couple other less common ones. And they'll defoliate a plant, which may impact yield, but it's a little less common uh, than some of our other insect issues. So, uh, and bean plants can handle up to 35% defoliation prior to flowering and uh, about 15% after flowering. So those chewers can cause yield loss by completely removing the small pods. We see that sometimes, the developing pods. Um, or they may chew up whole beans in the pod, which of course causes yield loss. Uh, but they may just take a bite out of a bean. And then we have a quality issue because people don't want to buy half eaten beans. So uh, those need to be cleaned out of the beans and we call that pick. And the other way chewers can cause quality issues is they leave a hole in the pod where disease can come in and, and that damages the quality. And some beans will also just change color when they're exposed to oxygen. So and then I guess the suckers, as I called them, they have this stylus, which is a mouth part, kind of like a syringe or a needle that they poke into the plant tissue and they feed by sucking. So they may feed on leaves and cause damage that leads to yield loss, or they may feed directly on pods and beans, which again, damages the quality of those beans. So misshapen or shriveled or discolored. So Megan, let's run through the season and identify some key pests growers need to look out for. Um, planters will start to roll in the weeks ahead. Um, what are the what are the key early season pests that uh, you know we need to be aware of? Uh, you know, and how do we best control them? Yeah, so early in the season, of course, we're relying on our insecticide seed treatment. So in Ontario, most of our beans are treated with Cruiser Max. Um, but in cool, wet springs we, is when we tend to have issues. So if you see gaps in the stand or wilting seedlings, you want to dig up those plants and check the seeds or the roots for usually seed corn maggot. So seed corn maggot are yellowish. They're white larvae, one centimeter or less in length. Um, they don't have legs. <laughs> Their body tapers towards the mouth. And um, it could be seed corn maggot or other closely related species. So and they'll burrow into the seed or the hypocotyl or the root. And you'll just find them generalized across the field. Um, if you have repeated issues, there are ways of monitoring prior to planting. Wireworm we sometimes hear about, but they're less common. Um, we, we don't see them as often in later planted fields. And they're less common in tilled fields. So, uh, But they're a little bit longer, up to four centimeters, brown, hard-bodied. Um, yeah, but like I said, I, I've never really seen wireworm damage, although it could, could happen. And then it's just a matter of assessing whether you have enough plants for a reasonable yield or stand. Um, and also if you have enough time left, like on the calendar to, uh, replant and harvest before the weather turns poor in the fall. Hmm. Hey, let's, uh, let's move into the season and above ground. Uh, what do growers need to be looking for, uh, especially when it comes to, to leaf feeding? Yeah, so there's lots of lots of insects that we can see, um, but uh, the keys are really potato leafhopper and spider mites, I think, um, in, in the vegetative stages. So again, those chewing insects, it's fairly obvious when they've chewed on the leaves, but usually there isn't a lot of defoliation. So then we kind of look to, do we have distorted or puckered leaves with that are yellow around the margins or scor scorched leaf margins? That's what we call hopper burn. And it's usually, you know, that's caused by potato leaf hopper. 
Um, sometimes we think it's a nutrient deficiency or water deficiency or herbicide damage, but um, yeah, leafhopper are an important one and are quite common. Um, you may, if you see damage, yield loss has already occurred. So um, they, you kind of need to control that before there's damage. Um, and so they may be here late in the spring when we're planting dry beans, but our seed treatment kind of holds mm -hmm. them off for a few weeks. Um, so we're, we're glad to have that cruiser max, but uh, they may move into the edible bean fields when uh, alfalfa fields are cut and, uh, and they may be more prevalent when it's dry. So they're pretty easy to identify. They're small and green, wedge shaped, about three millimeters long, um, but they're difficult to count because they fly away when you approach. So the nymphs will stay on the underside of the leaves, but unfortunately you have to use a sweep net to, to scout for them with accuracy. And we don't have a, th I often get asked, what's the threshold per plant? Well, we don't really have one. You kind of have to use a sweep net and compare to the charts that we have on, um, on each bean growth stage and number per sweep. So and then the other one of course is a uh, spider mite. Um, they cause leaf damage, they feed on leaves and cause that stippled, like sandblasted look. Mm -hmm. um, and the leaves will look yellow or bronze and they'll curl up and eventually fall off. And they're pretty common when it's hot and dry. So uh, patches of damage actually might be confused with moisture stress. And again, if you see damage, you kind of already have some yield loss. So the threshold is only four mites per leaflet or one severely damaged leaf per plant. Uh, pr prior to pod fill. So um, they're, they're even smaller than leaf hoppers. So again, they're difficult to see. Um, and, and we want to get our insecticide on as soon as we kind of identify that we have a problem to, to protect the yield. What about uh, later in the season, Megan? Uh, what pests feed on those pods that we've worked so hard to grow? You know, what do we need to watch out for here? Yeah, the, the insects just keep coming, Vern. Um, the big one everyone's talking about these days is Western Mean Cutworm. So it's found at high levels in all our dry bean growing regions in Ontario. And it's also a pest of corn. Um, so the larvae chew on the pods and the beans in the pod, and that causes both yield and quality issues. Um, although it's difficult to estimate how much damage they're really causing. And I find this to be a very annoying pest because as a, as a dry bean extension specialist, we don't really... I can't tell you to scout. Scouting doesn't seem to work. They're impossible to find. And we don't really have thresholds for, for when you should control them. All we can do is set up a, th a pheromone trap on the field, catch the adult moth, and then apply our insecticide 10 to 20 days after peak moth flight, which is after the majority of eggs have been laid and have hatched. So in that system, we don't know how much damage they have caused or might have caused other than looking for pods that have been damaged. But having a trap tells us when to, when to spray. Um, so lots of details on Western bean cutworm, but if you boil it right down, that's really all the advice I, I can offer. Okay, Megan, final question. Now, you know, when you think about how the season is shaping up, any advice or strategies for edible growers on, on what they could be doing better or differently, um, you know, when it comes to managing pests in their crops? Yeah, so actually the one thing in Ontario anyway that we want to draw growers' attention to is two-spotted spider mite really only have one insecticide we've been using for them in the past, dimethoate. And we know we have uh, resistant populations now. So uh, we want growers and agronomists to contact Omafra, myself or Tracy Bowdy, if they find spider mites so we can collect samples. Um, yeah, and so there is one other product that's now registered in dry beans, it's called Oberon, but I'm, I'm sure it's typically used in hort crops. So I'm not sure the price point on that one yet, but yeah, just, uh, just want to be aware of spider mite uh, control issues. And um, the other thing is scouting for insects and dry beans is a lot of work. So um, I've said a few times that they're difficult to scout for. They fly away. You need a sweep net and you may not even have a sweep net. So, um, you know, and I didn't even touch on all the beneficials or other insects that you might find. So uh, in, in edible beans, quality is really important. So it's the kind of crop where it might be helpful to hire a scout or draw on other resources. Maybe your specialist uh, like Dennis Lang in, in Manitoba, um, because we really don't want to apply insecticides when we don't have to. And we certainly don't want to spray off any beneficials or pollinators in the field. So yeah, protect your quality, but uh, make, make smart decision, decisions. Oh. Hey, uh, Megan, some great insights. Hey, thanks for joining me on the Edible Bean School. Yeah, thanks again, Brian. This has been great.